Grumpel, and I'll be hosting uh, today's conversation with John Grayson, which is part of the Queering the Industry program of the 21st uh, Career Film Festival, Mezipatra. Um, just a quick note for the beginning, um, this masterclass will only be held in English, and um, I'll say it in Czech. Um, dovolu vás, dovoluji se vás upozornit, že následující masterclass bude probíhat v českém jazyce bez překladu. Um, hello, John. Hey, great to see you. Good to see you too. Um, let me just um, briefly introduce um, John to our audiences today, um, although I'm quite sure that many will be familiar with this uh, icon of uh, career cinema. Uh, John Grayson is an avant-garde Canadian filmmaker, director, video artist, um, activist, and educator. Um, he started his career in Canada in the 1980s as a journalist and soon began making uh, short films and videos. Many recurrent themes in uh, John Grayson's work include uh, queer politics, HIV AIDS activism, um, especially access to medication, um, solidarity, political action with the marginalized um, groups, um, and there's a theme that runs through John's work, um, and that is a profound interest in history. Um, his very first feature film, uh, Uncut, from 1988, uh, features um, a group of uh, queer um, artists um, from various periods of time, including the Soviet filmmaker Sergei Einstein uh, or the Mexican artist Frida Kahlo, um, who are mysteriously summoned to Toronto in the late 80s um, to deal with the a real life issue of policing of uh, gay sex in public washrooms. Um, a urinal was John's first win of the Teddy Award um, at Berlinale, and he um, won the prestigious award again in 1991 with his short musical Making of Monsters uh, about homophobic violence and toxic masculinity. Um, then again, uh, he won Berlin Hour and the Teddy Award with um, Fig Trees, which is a 2009 Gertrude Stein-inspired uh, documentary um, polyphonic opera about AIDS activists uh, Tim McCaskill and um, Zeki Ahmed in Cape Town, uh, narrated by an albino squirrel, an amputee busker, and Saint Teresa. One of his best-known films is Lilies from 1996. Um, it's a universally acclaim acclaimed drama. Um, shown, it was shown at a number of festivals, including Toronto, Locarno, and others. Um, it was nominated for 14 Genie Awards, which is the Canadian National Awards, um, winning four, including Best Picture. And it was a major uh, mainstream success for a queer film back in uh, the 90s. Um, John is also known for his work for Palestine Solidarity. In 2008, he helped form Queers Against Israeli Apartheid, which is a coalition of pro-Palestinian gays and lesbians opposed to the so-called pinkwashing, which is a promotional strategy of Israel um, to create an image uh, of um, a sort of um, gay tolerance in the Middle East, which is used to cover up the um, oppression of Palestinians. Um, John was part of the protests against the Toronto International Film Festival in 2009 uh, when the Israeli government um, worked closely uh, with the um, festivals, um, with the festival's uh, team to promote Israel. In 2013, uh, John was on his way to Gaza um, via uh, Egypt, where he was arrested for 50 days before being released. Um, queer cinema scholar Thomas Wall has described uh, John's work as a convergence of techno-wizardry, dense elusiveness, camp anachronisms, unabashed didacticism, melodramatic narrative, heady eroticism, and media collage. And we'll see some of these aesthetics in a few clips from John's work later. John is also currently a professor at York University's film school, where he teaches film and video theory, um, film production and editing. Um, this is John's second time at Mezipatra. Uh, the festival hosted a retrospective of his work in 2007 when he came to personally present the films both in Prague and Brno. Uh, welcome back, John. Great to be back. 
Um, to everybody watching uh, from home, um, you can ask your questions to John in the comments below uh, the stream, both in Facebook and in YouTube, and we'll take time to answer any questions you might have. John, um, your work is very varied. You worked in all the media. You made uh, video. You made big-budget celluloid films. Uh, you made opera, video installations. Um, videos for public transport screens. Um, you worked in all kinds of genres. Uh, where do you currently feel most at home? It, it all of the above, I think. I love uh, being able to explore different platforms, especially in this new digital world. So when I'm, I currently teach in a new media program at York University, and one of our, our ideas for the, the department is new stories for new screens, and especially new queer, for me, new queer stories for new queer screens. And what the screens in our lives are from handheld, from phones to uh, monitors on subway platforms uh, to uh, Skyping with Prague today. Um, these, are the, these are the ways we tell our stories today. And so a lot of my work this past year, of course, has ended up being about the technologies of Zoom, about the technologies of social distancing, about the technologies of pandemic. Yeah, I'd be curious to know, what do your students most aspire to when they come to your, to your school? Uh, are they excited about new technologies or do they have like big Hollywood dreams? They're, they're, they're you know, they're, they're small town Canadians with, uh, Hollywood dreams, of course. They would, you know, they they want to do a, they want to do a series on Netflix. They want to do um, a series on HBO. That sort of that sort of model. And so, trying to break them out of that and say, we're actually in a, we're actually much further along as a society and in terms of communication potential. Let's all be part of a new wave, exploring new new screen platforms, but also trying to. Um, emphasize to them that the stories being told within Hollywood and within broad, within uh, Netflix are extremely limited. They're extremely conservative. They're extremely um, conventional. And we really try to, again, stress that idea of new stories for new screens need new forms. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I'd like to start by looking at some of your recent work um, that we'll see a clip from a short documentary about sex work in uh, this um, recent pandemic. Um, the film is called Prurient. Um, don't worry if you don't know what it means. I had to look it up myself. Uh, the dictionary definition is um, having or encouraging an excessive interest in sexual matters, especially the sexual activity of others. So uh, let's uh, take a look at the clip, please. Sex workers have always been at the forefront of, of various technologies to uh, create content or to uh, be able to, to make a living and run their businesses, right? The, the internet is a great example, VHS, DVD, uh, you know, streaming, all of these things have, have, were, were used and brought to prominence by sex workers uh, at the beginning, at the forefront or the avant-garde of these sort of technologies. There were these, memes immediately of like, well, I guess I'm going to be a cam girl now, you know, just like average sort of people being like, I guess if I'm going to be in lockdown and can't work, I'm going to just like start my cam business. And I'm sure we'll see people after the fact out of necessity, young people who may otherwise have not engaged in sex work coming into sex work. Um, Jacob, uh, the protagonist of your documentary, is talking about how he had to adapt to uh, technology. Um, as, as a result of the pandemic uh, and how he had to migrate his sex work from physical reality onto cams. And I was wondering, how do you feel about um, sex work um, now being a part of uh, platform capitalism with services such as those you mentioned in the film or OnlyFans? I think, like, like Jacob, I see it as a continuum. I see sex work has always been about commerce and on the one hand, I think we have a, a duty to fight for the rights of sex workers, recognizing their status as as workers. Um, and and like all workers, they should be protected in terms of working conditions. 
um, business relations, the you know safety for sex workers, um, as well as uh, you know accessing all the other things workers can access, like healthcare. Um, these are these are basics. New new technologies, new platforms, aren't uh, aren't a shift so much as a continuing transition, a continuing evolution of what um, sex work is. What the, what the film was trying to do was get inside his own experience of loss of intimacy and that those feelings of isolation by being forced onto screens as opposed to in-person contact. And he talks about the importance in sex for him of physical contact, which we, we can all relate to. Um, so that was made back in April when Canada had just locked down. Um, we were just under, our, it was our first month of lockdown like everybody else, I was new to um, this new prison of, you know, the new virtual prison we were living inside of. And so you can see me running around the utterly deserted streets of Toronto um, in a, a metaphor of isolation and searching and contrasting that running with, with his own, Jacob's own experience of being trapped on screen when he wanted to be in person. Yeah, um, I think you'd be really saddened to see the empty streets of Prague now. It's a completely different city under lockdown. Um, let me get back to um, to the technology and the issue of technology. Um, you have done a lot of work um, on surveillance and policing. And um, when I think of digital platforms, I think of our digital footprints, um, of how we ourselves become products of social media. And as an extension of that, um, I can't stop thinking about how technology, surveillance technology, uh, can be used for hardcore um, policing and control of populations in places like China. So um, do you have any thoughts about how um, bringing sex works to online platforms can be part of it? Do, can you see any dangers to our autonomy, self you know, control over our image and all that? I think we were joking before the broadcast began about how it, there's there's conspiracy theories out there that Zoom, in fact, was the one who invented COVID as a as a marketing strategy, as a way to build their their brand. And so you you guys today are being resistant by skyping with me as opposed to zooming with me. Um, I think I think technologies the same analysis I used around surveillance technology and urinal, or is it? 30 years ago, 30 years ago, I, I still think deeply applies to our societies today, where it's not the technologies per se, it's not the cameras, it's not the surveillance cameras that are the problem. It's the state apparatus, in that case implemented by the police, but any arm of the state and or the, the uh, corporate community who's exploiting those technologies for their benefit is where our focus should be. And, and so, as someone who makes, as someone who works in media and thinks about media, I'm always trying to use media to critique media. So using Skype and using Zoom to make critiques of what other uses of Zoom and, and, and other platforms can be. I think the surveillance issues that, that so many have raised around social media are absolutely urgent. But does that mean we withdraw or does that mean we uh, subvert? And so I've always landed on the subversion side. Yeah. Um, also, um, when we're talking about larger like multinational um, corporations like Facebook or uh, Google or whoever owns OnlyFans, um, these are, I think, a little more difficult to um, tackle um, in activism as opposed to your local government or the city council or whoever is uh, installing CCTV cameras or policing certain areas. How can we as individuals or grassroots communities um, fight back against the larger players? I think, there, I think um, we can start by looking to histories of other social movements that have likewise taken on Capitalism and corporate America, most of most of it being America, but it's a it, you know it's a global economy, and we have to um, take on the European corporations and the Canadian corporations as well, of course. But um, I think we can learn lots from battles waged by previous generations. 
because the, the I think again the the important thing for us as activists is always to recognize the continuities and the continuums of social practices, both both pro and con. So we recognize continuities in terms of our resistance and our activism, but equally recognize how capitalism year after year, not very imaginative, capitalism keeps finding the same ways with tweaks to exploit us. So I think I think Facebook, Google, et cetera, they famously love to wrap themselves in modernity. And when we speak about pinkwashing, looking at Silicon Valley and looking at new technologies and how they love to say, oh, we're so queer, we're so trans, we're so cool. And uh, that emphasis on um, being um, on the side of the people and on the side of free speech and et cetera, et cetera. And what they've done very effectively is wrap their brands and their their profit margins um, in the veneer of modernity. But I don't think we should be fooled for a sec. Um, and I think right now the movements critiquing social media are very powerful and very effective. True. Um, let's take a look back at the time when brands were not uh, so enthusiastic about pinkwashing and using the rainbow flag to uh, market their product to us. Um, one of the main um, topics of your work and activism, as if these could be separated, um, is HIV and AIDS and um, victim blaming and access to medication. Uh, one of your most famous films, Zero Patients, uh, which would be the closing film of the festival had it actually taken in physical theaters, um, is about it. Um, the film examines um, and refutes the urban legend of the alleged introduction to HIV, of HIV to North America by a single patient. Um, the film tells the story against the backdrop of a romance between a time-displaced Victorian sexologist and uh, the ghost of Zero. Um, let's see a clip from the film, ironically. Um, Having spoken about surveillance before, uh, we are streaming this masterclass on Facebook and Google, so we cannot use the clip that I wanted to use because of its nudity. I'm sure, John, you know um, which I'm talking about. It's, it's the butthole duet. Um, but we'll uh, discuss um, this particular scene from the film anyways. And let's see a clip that is safe for um, Facebook. <laughs>
to Zero Patients. Um, the film was released in 1993, I believe, um, and it tells about the, imp the impatience um, uh, we as community had with Big Pharma, with governments, with uh, victim blaming. Um, is there currently anything you are impatient about when it comes to HIV and AIDS? It's, a, it's been interesting revisiting Zero. We're at the 28th anniversary, 27th anniversary of making it. And it was very much coming out of five, year, five previous years of being very active in AIDS activism, especially in ACT UP in New York uh, and LA. I was teaching in LA at the time. And then also um, AIDS Action Now in Toronto, which was my real base and my real formation of AIDS activism. And so that film was trying to take all the work we were doing in the grassroots and in video art and, you, you know, very marginal and underground and taking it somewhat mainstream, tiptoeing into the multiplexes. And we did succeed up to, uh, you know, in relative terms, we sold to 13 countries in the, U in the U.S. The theatrical release was the same week as Philadelphia. And at first, our producers thought, this is a disaster. You know, how can we go up against Tom Hanks? But in fact, it proved to be one of the best things that could happen to the film because v reviewers and audiences had this very clear choice between, on the one hand, Tom Hanks' melodrama, a very conservative film, a very conservative formally and politically, um, a conservative AIDS film for Hanky uh, melodrama versus our crazy anarchist musical about AIDS activism and blame and trying to get people through music and humor inside the movement. So it turned out to be one of the best things that could happen. Today, now 27 years later, I'm leading a research project which is looking back at that incredible explosion of AIDS media, especially locally in Toronto, but also globally. So looking at work that was made throughout Europe in the States, in South Africa in particular, there was an explosion of, of independent media that began then. And then um, we're not, the, the crucial thing is we're not just looking back historically through rose-colored glasses at an amazing moment of activism. We're also looking at today and what needs to be said about AIDS today in the midst of new pandemic, in the midst of an AIDS crisis, which in the global north is often perceived to be over. The AIDS crisis is over. We have PrEP. We have U equals U. We have um, but treatment drugs, which are, which are completely saving lives. So being diagnosed HIV positive is no longer a death sentence. And in the global south, we have just the opposite. 700,000 people dying every year. Uh, so AIDS continues to be a pandemic in the global south. But of course, in the, in, with the, the indifference of the North, that tends to get lost, tends to get forgotten. We only focus on, on the lives we now save in the North, but forget about nearly a million people a year in the South. And so when we think about pandemics, it's been fascinating to do this AIDS work then and now in relation to our new pandemic, which is as serious as can be. And I really, for, you know, reading the headlines about what you guys are going through in terms in Prague uh, and the numbers, it's truly terrifying. And, uh, you know, I hope all, everyone in the festival is is managing to navigate the incredible, the extreme challenges of doing a festival in a pandemic. Thank you for thinking of us. Um, um, and also, I'd like to thank the whole team for um, pulling through and being resilient and um, migrating the entire festival online when it was yeah. very unclear as to what the government you know, would do, what the restrictions and rules would be. So this is a huge shout out to everybody who's making this possible. And to especially to the team that created this condom studio that you've put yourself inside of. Yes. I'm very impressed. Yeah, I love it. I feel very contagion, um, contagion safe. Um, Let's let's uh, go back to um, uh, zero patients. Do you think um, this this movie would be possible to uh, you know to be made today? I mean, in terms of like it's because it's very it's very brave aesthetically. It's very it cannot be further away from conventions and and conservative uh, aesthetics and storytelling. And um, like you said, you managed to. Uh, 
uh, run it theatrically in a distribution in, in 13 countries and have funding to make it. So um, what are your thoughts? Uh, do we have courageous queer filmmaking now? It was, I, I think we don't have courageous queer filmmaking. I see, I go, I go to lots of queer festivals and I try to, I really try to keep up and realism once again, realism goes in waves and we see realism and naturalism come and go and Zero Patients very much came out of an explosion of a new generation of new queer cinema, testing, breaking, breaking rules, testing forms. This was the era of Todd Haynes making Poison, you know, his radical, very important film about AIDS, or Derek Jarman, of course. There was an explosion of new queer cinema that was radical in form and content. Today, there are there are there's there's a plethora of very well made, very powerful realist films which tell isolated stories, um, and we. I, we we as a community seem to have lost that spirit of experimentation and that that crucial insight that our new queer stories, especially as they've evolved, new queer trans stories need new radical forms in order to properly tell them. We've lost that instinct and instead we've fallen back on melodrama. So I um, I'm always optimistic, and I do feel um, this this particular political moment of Black Lives Matter is breaking, is knocking down barriers and breaking open doors. And I think we're, we're in for a new period of new radicalism that's intersectional, that's connecting up anti-racism with uh, queer liberation and queer and trans liberation in ways that are going to be very exciting and hopefully result in some bold new films that include musicals and humor. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, we cannot show the clip, um, unfortunately, but I'd still like to talk about the the butthole duet. Um, the of viewers, course. the viewers at home, uh, can watch Zero Patients anytime. It's part of the online festival, so I hope this uh, will motivate you to watch Zero Patients. Um, in the song, there's lyrics such as "Oedipus is weeping when I, my butt I do caress," um, or "It is an insult to the empire uh, when I take it up the bum." Um, suddenly ain't so symbolic, your rectum ain't the grave. Um, Freud said we have a death wish, uh, getting buggered is getting uh, killed, or if the asshole ain't so special, then the fellas cannot be either. John, I'm 100% sure that the song is played again and again in hundreds of gender studies classes all over the world. <laughs> um, can, can you talk about um, the song and the references in the song a bit? Well, I always thought of it as a date night song, so I'm a bit disappointed that you're <laughs> only seeing it in classrooms when it should be in the bedrooms too. <laughs> the, um, the, the goal, and it, it, it stemmed from earlier work. In, in, urinal, in my film Urinal, I was using Foucault to unpack private versus public uh, uh, policing of sexuality. In my film The Making of Monsters, I was unpacking I was using Brecht and, and Lukács to debate the nature of realism in terms of depicting anti-gay violence. So I've always been interested in bringing critical theory, especially new critical theory, in, onto, the, onto queer screens and into queer stories. For instance, uh, a sort of flash forward, I'm just in the process of editing a new scene about Palestine solidarity, and it uses... Judith Butler collaborating with BTS, the great boy, the great Korean boy band. And so they're collaborating on a piece about Palestine solidarity and anti-Semitism. And it's the, the joy of bringing Butler to the dance floor, um, rewriting Dynamite is, um, it, 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 it's, keep, it's getting us through the pandemic, shall we say. But with, with the particulars of Zero Patients, this was um, very directly inspired by Leo, Barsani, Leo Barsani's famous theory piece, is the, rectum, uh, is the Rectum a Grave? And so his focus on in the age of AIDS before treatment, when uh, a new pathologization in every sphere from the public, public and political realms to the privacy of our bedrooms, made queer sex once again, not just deviant, not just pathologized, but 
we started to internalize that do we have a death wish? Is queer sex by definition uh, lethal? And the, the, the fight back, um, if, if, you know, it's not just, you know, use a condom every time. It's not just safer sex education. Safer sex education was failing miserably at speaking to the deep fears that we were living through in that time. And I think this will probably resonate for people living through the fears, which may be irrational, but nevertheless are very real in terms of our experience of COVID and our experience of navigating possible infection and, our, and how we interact with people. And when we're under such stress and such uh, pressure, um, how, how that plays out in, in unconscious terms, in psychological terms, in emotional terms, in our lives, and how it impacts on every aspect of our lives, including sex. Um, so with, with, with Zero Patients, the idea was taking uh, these ideas coming out of queer theory, applying them through an activist lens to the two main characters, and them having a, deb a, a singing debate. And at first I was going to stage it just as two actors in bed singing to each other, and it just was sort of flat and not working. Mm -hmm. And then I moved the duet three feet south, and when their assholes opened up and began to sing to each other, then the song really started to work. And then the the embedded the the nudity, because really the the butt puppets we used were more like Muppets than anything else. It was sort of like Bert and Ernie. So it that's not what YouTube was worried about. But the, there was a scene of naked. Uh, guys doing uh, sort of exercise routines that are the counterpoint dance moves of the song. And the, the really important thing, which is utterly buried for most viewers, is that these were the AIDS activists of the city, all working in various AIDS service organizations across the board. And so it was getting together an entire generation of AIDS activists, getting them all to strip down and drop their shorts and get naked together for an afternoon of, of doing dance routines. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that 30, uh, 30 years later almost, um, young gay men um, are more emancipated when it comes to their own sexuality or are we like reliving the same fear and self sort of internalized um, homophobia? New, new versions, same themes. So there's the continuum and then there's what's what's unique and different about a generation today. So a generation today is navigating um, the depersonalization of grinder, is is navigating the transactional action transactional nature of um, sex that's not necessarily in the bars, especially during lockdown, um, has migrated to the that you know this this year's new iteration of online platforms. Um, I think to uh, the the impact of prep of you versus you of crystal meth of party and play all make the the world today an extremely both recognizable and utterly new universe. So I think for I think for young gay men today navigating and discovering a gay world, I think they look at zero patients and it describes another century, which in fact, literally it was. Um, it, it's, it's 28 years ago isn't so long, but it's also another lifetime, another generation. And I think we urgent, it's again, it's the urgency. We need films which are using new forms to speak about the grinder prep, crystal meth world of navigating sex today in ways that can speak and engage and especially with, especially with activism and speak and engage and find ways to get activists activists in the street i think most young gay men i know their identif their identification with activism is not with queer politics per se which have become so conservative but instead it's with black lives matter where were the where were people out on the streets it was for the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Yeah, and a lot of people, thankfully, are um, also active in the uh, climate crisis uh, movement, I think, which is... Of course. Yeah, uh, incredibly important, I think, too. Um, it, it, yeah. I was just, just going to say the forest fires have been very much in 
in our lives because my my elder daughter's uh, partner is a firefighter who got seconded down to California. So we were watching the California fires with great intensity. And when I think about everything that America is going through, Canada loves to be smug. I mean, we're famous for being polite and we're also famous for being smug um, very undeservedly. We have, we have a host of problems. But when we look at everything America has been going through this past week, this past summer, whether it's the fires or, or, the, or the protests, the, the toxic culture of toxic racist culture, um, I, I feel great relief being able to come home to Toronto and navigate, navigate this world of relative sanity. It's it's still one world though, and uh, the climate crisis or the you know failing yeah. democracy in America and in many countries in Europe as well um, is something that should worry us all. Um, and now on top of it all, we have pandemic. How how do you um, how do you keep optimism? How do you keep you know pushing for change in such challenging times? It's it, I think this has been true through all these decades that generally I've I've. Um, I've, I've sought the optimism through activism, so I've sought it through getting involved and um, the energy of being in a room planning a campaign. Um, I'm part of a, this, this uh, Palestine Solidarity campaign that's doing a webinar on Thursday. Um, so the, there's ways of connecting to people despite not being able to ever see them except, except through a screen. Um, but being able to connect and actually do things, not just have the social exchange, which is also essential, but equally have that sense of we're working on something and we're making progress and we're reaching people and communicating and having a dialogue despite all the challenges. So I think, I, I, I think in times of, um, I, I, you know, it, depression is, depression is, uh, it, depression is as much a pandemic as, as the virus itself, but um, I think one of the best antidotes, one of the best uh, vaccines for depression is finding, a, finding something to get involved with. And activism for me, queer activism in particular, has always been uh, there. Yeah, thank you for this. One of the scenes that was resonating uh, when I was re-watching um, Zero Patients was the shower scene, the song about you know, the uncertainty of what will happen to me, will this treatment work, are the doctors right, um, uh, what can I do? Um, it feels, I mean, of course, it, we were not in the midst of the AIDS crisis uh, in the 80s and 90s, it's a completely different pandemic, but this feeling of being un, you know, overwhelmed with conflicting information, with um, distrust in authorities, um, feels very much like what the song expresses. Is there anything that you are very impatient about when it comes to the recent pandemic? I was reading a great interview with Greta Thunberg yesterday, and she was talking about exactly that, that question of um, what makes her impatient, what makes her furious. And the, she, you, I, one, of the, one of the things that really stayed with me was she made this distinction between ideology and science. And Climate science couldn't be clearer. There's nothing, and and one of the the bedrocks of her activism has always been this, you know, uh, like I'm a kid and I understand the science. What's the matter with you people? And yeah, I think the the clarity of being able to differentiate between science and ideology is certainly a lesson that America could have benefited from through this past year of pandemic denial and Trump Trump's Trump's criminal activities. I hope there's some court in the world that can someday bring him to bring him to trial for um, his criminal behavior around the pandemic, because there is solid science around. Uh, there's absolutely solid science around uh, COVID and around the pandemic. And the the, um, the the culture of certainty and uncertainty, which was one of the main themes that organized zero patients was very time specific. It was when we had no cure. The cures we had were driven by big pharma like AZT. They were toxic, discredited cancer medications which have been gathering dust on the shelf. 
and then dust it off and foist it on a population of people who were so desperate and so needy they would take any pill. And AZT made, more, made people more sick than it, anything else. So Zero Patients was very much um, written in a moment where big science had been, uh, big science had no answers and big pharma stepped into the vacuum and, and governments and either, either ignored or manipulated the crisis to their own end, the AIDS crisis to their own ends. So the culture of uncertainty that was being sung about was, um, was very much um, of that moment. Since then, we, we um, have extraordinary knowledge about the, the, the science of AIDS and the pendulum swung back to ideology. Why do we smugly, as, as, as the global north say, we've solved AIDS when a hundred, nearly a million people a year are dying in the global south. How, how, are, how does science explain that indifference to extraordinary suffering? Yeah, true. Um, so would you agree that the, you said, you know, you were thinking about what, what uh, kind of AIDS image, images and stories we need, um, those would be um, images of our indifference? What um, I think uh, what we're doing with, as a research project, one of the things we're doing is we're going to commission five films over three years, five, five films per year over three years. So 15 new films by a new generation of mostly 20 something, some 30 something uh, activists, filmmakers, artists, people living with AIDS, people who've never thought about HIV in their lives, but have done work around activist work and their filmmakers I'm already in dialogue with in places like Ethiopia or Tanzania or Lebanon uh, the, this um, or First Nations communities in the in the far north um, here in Canada so it's 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 together in a workshop context us trying to identify what are the eight stories that we need to hear today and one of the things I've been emphasizing as a sort of mentor or workshop leader, is the, the more specific the stories are, the more chance they have to speak. So um, the, the model of doing a profile of a singular individual in an extraordinary circumstance, like an aid service worker on the ground in Beirut navigating a post-earthquake um, gay community who's having unsafe sex, um, or um, it's someone on the ground in Zanzibar fighting around treatment access and why are the why are these treatment drugs why why don't they have why don't people with living with AIDS have treatment drugs like what they they know is available in the north across the across the counter so it's each, each of these people identifying from their particular subject position from their particular community an AIDS story um, and finding an innovative way to tell that story. And the more precise, the more specific, the more chance they'll have of um, actually actually making an intervention, making a difference. The, the, the workshop project is called Viral Interventions. And um, as I said, there'll be 15 over, rolling out over the next three years. Perfect. Um, let's, let's now talk about history. Um, as I said, it's one of the, uh, the major um, themes in your work um, from films like The Making of Monsters, Urinal, Zero Patients, Lilies, Proteas. Um, um, you, they are based on either historical events or historical characters, um, but of course they are reinterpreted <laughs> and retold in your um, own style. Um, we'll now take a look at Lilies. Uh, you yourself once described the film as a jeune inflected uh, via Fellini fable. Um, the central narrative of Lilies, which shifts between uh, prison narrative and historical drama, uh, presents a play within a film and features multiple layers of storytelling and perspective, which is typical of New Queer Cinema, like you mentioned. And uh, we'll see uh, a bit of it in the next clip. I can tell you're lying. I'll show you if I'm lying. He's got a break down the door. Chaplain, 
and do something. Your Excellency, Stop please. Him. Let me out of here. I'll handle this. I said someone should block Let the door. Let me something. out of here. Light. Our show is not over. I promise. I'll forget everything that has gone on here. You're all the victims of a sick man's imagination. I believe Simon's story. Oh, yes. Whenever he and Valier met, there were dirigibles and sunset, and the sweet sound of the boys' choir filled the air. The show is not over. Please, go back to the confessional. I can't guarantee your safety much longer. What did he do to cast a spell over you like this? He told us his story. Simon shows us one by one. These are the men they keep separate in the yard. The ones they send away from the dining hall. The ones they piss on. Do you have no idea how hard we work to prepare all this? Corsets are forbidden here. We might take the laces and hang ourselves. Dying is forbidden here. Guess we'd better not tell you the favors we did for our certain guards. <laughs> <laughs> Simon may have stretched the truth a bit about his love story, but it's so beautiful. For your uh, own salvation, let me leave. For our what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, that's Lily's. We saw a clip in which uh, the inmates explain to the main audience, the bishop, um, what they had to do to be able to put up uh, an autobiographical play about um, his personal history um, in prison. Um, I love um, the unconventional, nonlinear um, take you have on uh, telling queer histories. Um, would you like to say um, how you come to construct the multiple narratives and um, the you know scenes within scenes and the collage um, style that you? employ this was uh, Lily's was an ad adaptation of a play by Montreal playwright Michelle Marc Bouchard uh, Les Felouettes and it had huge success it play it's played since over the intervening 30 years it's played all over the world um, in, in seven 17 languages um, it's we just recently had a restaging it was so exciting we had a restaging of Lily's in a local theater and the entire cast was black and indigenous and the prince of the, the premise of that was taking this prison story prisoners gathering to make a prison play about what had happened and speak to prison realities today who's locked up in prison especially queer prisoners they tend to be black tend to be indigenous in the canadian context or the american context so lily's has had a long life and a, and a, a fascinating aura of um, speaking to several generations of queers and so when Michelle Mark and the producer Anna Stratton approached me and said do you want to direct it as a film adaptation it was a challenge for me the first time I directed someone else's words um, the first time I'd adapted from an existing um, script and so and, and in particular one of the one of the crucial things about the play was it was play within a play it was a play about theater a, a play about the nature of the, 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 the possibility of theater to help us forget where we are and escape the bars and prison walls that we live within and so the, the challenge was how to how to maintain that thematic integrity on screen how do you translate theater onto the screen but still make it about cinema, make it fantastical. And so that's where Fellini comes in. There's some Jarman in there, I hope. I was freely, and, there, and the Genet comes from Genet's most famous, in fact, only film, Un Chant Amour, which is, a, of course, a prison drama, which is highly theatrical in terms of its conceit, even though it's very cinematic in that it's about two prisoners separated by a wall. And so it's cross-cutting between two spaces where prisoners can't see each other um, but the 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 all these influences it's it's in some ways it's my um, ode to an entire generation of queer cinema up to that up to that moment 
um, reaching back in history, but also also contemporary, and speaking to that sort of romanticism, which takes it away from the stuff I'm more I'm I'm, I'm maybe better known for the activist cinema around you know queers in the streets trying to change the world. Um, this is a much more personal, a much more um, emotional film, which of course that's because it's Michelle Marks' play that I was trying to be true to in the adaptation. Um, the, the, the question of history um, and queer history, right from when I was a teenager and sneaking books of, about queer lives, whatever few ones I could find in my small town uh, library growing up, um, the fascination of other queers and their stories and lives, especially queer artists, had always been incredibly powerful. And there was something about reading about Oscar Wilde when you're 15 and living a life in tiny little conservative London, Ontario, Canada, um, that opened doors and made for possibilities. You could you could start to imagine. So a lot of my cinema is populated by figures from queer history, whether it's Sergei Eisenstein or Frida Kahlo, um, Brecht, well, Brecht, I, I queer Brecht in Making of Monsters, or, or Richard Burton in, in Zero Patients. The film I'm currently working on, to bring it full circle, um, features an aging Genet living in Palestine. Um, and it's based on the true story of him in the early 70s living with the Palestinian guerrillas in their camp in the hills of Jordan. Um, but then updating that to the present and asking the question, would would Genet, would Jean Genet, the great radical iconoclastic revolutionary anarchist, would he have um, embraced queer BDS, queer boycott, divestment, sanctions as a tactic for fighting for Palestinian justice? So that's the that's you know, I, these these historical figures. I can't seem to let go of them. Um, they continue to haunt me. There's a lot of ghosts in the room. That, that's great. I think that a, a lot of times queers are being erased from history and uh, we have to queer, or you said, queer historical figures or uh, dig deep um, to uncover queer stories. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you're doing it in your work. Um, when you were talking about growing up in London, Ontario and going to your local library, um, that kind of links to an audience questions we have in the comments. And the, the question is, is there any particular movie or any piece of art that initiated your work? Um, there, there's, I think the, the real origins of my work um, are the Toronto video art community of the late 70s, early 80s. I moved to Toronto in 1978 and I sort of got involved right away in the Queen West art scene. So not the Church Street, gay ghetto, gay bars, gay community per se, but more the gay activist community, which was located around Queen West, um, which was the emerging arts community, a warehouse district, um, cheap rents, and our own tiny little bars and our own tiny little queer world. And that community, that tiny microcosm community of queer artists and activists really was more formative than anything else. It gave me a, it gave me a method for making work. So of course I dreamed of making a, making something on the level of a Fassbinder or a Visconti, but there was no possibilities in terms of funding or a, a film industry which would allow for anyone to work at the level of a Fassbinder or a Visconti. So instead, what recourse did I have but turn to local models? And luckily they were there. So the work of General Idea, the legendary queer um, trio of avant-garde artists, Colin Campbell, the video artist. Um, these were some of the crucial uh, inspirations for ways of working with no money uh, and no training, but um, a postmodern method that was available and could be could be mobilized for the sort of themes I wanted to explore. Thank you. Um, now, uh, I suppose means of making a film can be uh, cheaper uh, with the digital, but at the same time, there's there don't seem to be any more um, 
cheap rents or cheap studio places or um, with the ongoing gentrification, you know, um, the challenges that the young artists have are, I think, quite different now. What do you think are the main obstacles young artists now have in Canada when they are starting out? It's in, in some ways it's remained the same. We, we still struggle to find studio space or just a, a method for living, um, a, a space, space to live in and create community. Um, employment, especially under COVID, the precarity of um, what it means to try and be a queer artist and, and make the rent and be part of a community. So people are finding their ways. People continue to innovate. Um, we're lucky to still have an intact, somewhat knock on wood, uh, somewhat art, uh, arts, arts council funding system, which is particularly conscious. A lot of us lobby to make it conscious around um, innovation. So a new uh, funding, funding priorities um, around funding first timers and a new generation of artists. So funding the emerging artists making that a priority, in particular diversity, so funding artists of color, black, indigenous, and people of color, and queer and trans. And so that's been, um, that, that's thrown a lifeline. It's never enough. Um, and then um, more than anything, more than any of the funding programs, um, it's, that, it's that question of community, and that's what we do. Um, still have, we had it then when I was lucky enough to start making work and we have it still now in terms of our queer film festivals, which are such an important place for us to gather. And I'm saying this with extraordinary irony as we sit in our condoms in Prague or our bedrooms in uh, Toronto and denied, denied that ability to actually uh, sit down to, or, or rub up against each other in a, um, you know, a warm lobby or sit in a dark theater together. Um, I think queer film festivals, queer organizing, queer activism, um, these are the things that remain very healthy. And um, I, I, I think, um, you know, I, on the one hand, I think it's urgent that we push back against the conservatism and the, and the, um, incredible, uh, this past decade, the incredible moves towards homo normalization, homo nationalism, in fact, um, as, as we, quote, gain our rights and integrate um, and swing to the more conservative side of the, of the trail, what's being lost, keeping, keeping aware of that. Um, but, but trying to keep, trying to keep radicalism alive, I think those are the those are the challenges facing young queer artists today. Yeah, thank you. Um, when I think about Lilies, um, I think that although being very far from conventional, it's still your most accessible um, film, in my opinion. Sure. How would you respond yeah. to the criticism that your work is sometimes inaccessible or elitist? How do you, um, you know, how do you balance sort of activism and wanting to have an audience um, for your political messages of with course. Um, filmmaking yeah. art? Yeah, I think the way I approach that question is, and, it, and it's the eternal question of, um, on the one hand, as an activist, you want to reach the most people possible and persuade and argue and debate and dialogue. And how do you do that most effectively? Making documentary operas featuring albino squirrels or Palestine solidarity films featuring not just Genet, but two gay penguins, is maybe not the most um, accessible or mainstream of approaches. Um, the, f the flip side is, I think um, this, 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 is, this takes a page out of Brecht. It returns to the, the idea of Brecht and shock, and the idea that if you can not passively give audiences what they think they want, but instead shock people, shock audiences into a recognition of the new, then maybe not just the new ideas, but the new forms which help them take in the new ideas, have an impact, have an in, make an intervention. And then I think um, one of the lies of culture, not just American culture, not just mainstream culture, uh, but world culture, 
has been always about audience and the idea that it's more effective if you reach a million people than if you reach a hundred people. And I tend to argue strenuously that art should be approached in the opposite way, that we're, we're all makers increasingly with a camera, a camera and a microphone on every phone. We're all potentially makers, all potentially filmmakers, and therefore we're all in a conversation together. There's no such thing as an old model of um, a, a, a secluded elite who make the films that preach down to the rest of the needy masses who have no means of expression themselves. No, it's the opposite. It's that there's there's this this incredible continuum again of big budget to no budget, but social media has allowed all sorts of little tiny videos made for 10 cents to go viral and experience and, and have an impact and intervene um, or simply reach a hundred people, but reach a hundred people and create a conversation, contribute to a conversation. So I think if artists can hold on to that notion, and I, I include myself, if we can hold on to the notion that we're all part of a dialogue and each of us bring something different to the table, then I can make my peace with my lack of big audiences, um, but um, the, the conviction that it's worth talking about Palestine using Janae and two gay penguins. It's worth talking about uh, zero patients with singing buttholes. And these interventions can be large and can be, can be small. And especially in the digital universe, there's more fluidity and more possibilities and surprises. I couldn't agree more, and I also think that film festivals like like ours uh, can help audiences, you know, navigate and um, discover a work that is that might be more challenging than what their Netflix algorithms are feeding them uh, based on their pre you know preferences. So, thanks for going for doing the incredible work that you're doing. Um, we have limited time. I think uh, I can squeeze in one last question, and that is. Uh, I was thrilled to find Lily's Legally on YouTube. Um, um, people can watch Zero, Patient Zero um, as part of the festival online. But generally, I think that queer films um, and minority films are being you know, uh, underrepresented by, um, you know, I think they're affected by the switch from physical media to digital. You know? um, how can we um, um, access your work, our independent work, if we live in Prague or elsewhere outside of uh, Canada? It's, a, it's an argument I have with my distributor, and I'm on the board of the distributor, so I'm very inside the, the debates. And we're, in fact, later on today doing a, um, a, a board meeting exactly on this. How do we, how do we respond uh, to the, the audience demands for video on demand in ways that still honor the need to pay artist fees? Um, we're, I, I, I tend to err on the side of, I want people to see the work. And so maybe I can find, maybe I'll find my rent by teaching. That's, a, and I'm lucky enough to be, to have a teaching job. Um, but I think, I think audiences can lobby their independent distributors and say, you know, f like figure out who's distributing the films they really love in your festival this year, go go back to those distributors and say, what are you doing to um, open these films up to online? Um, and likewise, your uh, likewise cultural governments, like you know, country by country, there should be much more subsidy for governments saying we want our artists' work to be seen. Let's create the platforms. Let's let's flow some money to create the platforms, not just give it to the broadcasters, but instead um, open it up to the smaller distributors who can make work available. Yeah. Well, um, unfortunately, this is the 
all the time we had, I'm, I'm getting um, images of schools on the screen saying we need to stop um, because there's uh, other um, career in the industry programs uh, coming up in the live stream. Uh, thank you, John, so much for joining us uh, today, for getting up very early uh, to be able to talk to our audiences here in the Czech Republic. And hopefully, Mezi Patra will survive this and uh, will be able to present your future work in the future offline editions in theaters. Well, let, let's make it a date. Let's make it a plan that I will be able to come in person because it's just so frustrating. We had originally planned that I would come in person and then, of course, COVID. But the, the, uh, the, um, the importance of your festival, as you emphasized, it's a, it's a window on not just the new Netflix algorithm telling us what queer looks like, but the opposite, giving us, giving us windows on worlds and on forms and stories that otherwise nobody would see. And I, the thing I've always loved most about queer festivals is the surprises in audience, people who would never check out an avant-garde film in their everyday life, but somehow they've like had a drink in the lobby at your festival and chanced and, and or, or this year clicked on a button and said, I'll take a chance on that because it's wrapped in the festival condom. Yeah. So, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, John, and stay safe.